Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, and Eric Holm. Coming up on DTNS, Stephanie Humphrey helps us make sense of a California bill to punish social media companies for addiction, specifically related to children, why the tech media is going crazy over Apple's universal control, and Fido has new hope for killing the need for passwords. Hi, you dog. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, March 18th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, technology contributor to ABC News, author and host of the Tech John podcast, Stephanie Humphrey. Welcome back. Hey, good to be back. Happy to be here. Good to have you as well. Uh, we are going to get right into the tech news with some tech things you should know. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission is suing Meta, alleging in federal court that scam ads were being displayed on Facebook featuring public fe uh, figures promoting cryptocurrency, even after some of those public figures complained that their names and images were being used without consent. Fortescue Metals filed litigation against Meta in Australian and American courts over similar fake IDs. Meta's response is that it cooperated with the regulator's investigation so far and will defend itself in court. Russia's central bank announced Thursday that it has given major lender Sverbank a license to issue and exchange digital financial assets. Last month, blockchain platform Atomize Russia became the first firm to get the green light to exchange digital assets legally in Russia after the Russian government advocated a complete ban on trading and mining previously. Automakers have been dealing with chip supply problems for quite some time now, but Toyota was dealt another blow by the 7.4 magnitude earthquake in northeastern Japan that occurred on Thursday. Toyota suspended operations at three factories, losing 20,000 units in the stoppage. The company also announced it will stop production on 18 assembly lines for a few days next week due to part shortages. That's because Japanese part suppliers like Murata, which makes ceramic capacitors, and Renosis, which makes car ma microcontrollers, also had to pause production because of the quake. Grab is known to a lot of folks for its food delivery, uh, but it is often referred to as a super app uh, with lots of services. One of those services is loans. Grab is partnering with Sedania Asalam Capital to offer its Malaysian delivery workers Sharia-compliant financing. Grab Cash Financing I, as the product is called, does not require documents or collateral. To qualify, you just have to be earning a minimum of 800 ringgit a month, which is the equivalent of about $190 US. Sedania provides financial products through its Go Halal financing program, which uses digital commodities to enable real-time money transactions. During its announcement of the Galaxy A53 5G and A33 5G, Samsung also unveiled, somewhat quietly, the Galaxy A73 5G, a new top-tier phone in its mid-range A-series. With a 108-megapixel camera and a slightly bigger 6.7-inch display than the A53's 6.5-inch panel, Samsung says that the Galaxy 7 a uh, a73 5G will be available in select markets starting April 22nd, but we do not have word on price yet. All right. Let's talk a little bit about this thing that has got the, the internet ablaze. Oh, there. are they ever? Uh, so tech <laughs> headlines, <laughs> if, you, if you're in our uh, line of work, uh, rarely do they universally love anything. That's just the nature of tech news. However... We've got an anomaly today. Let's read a few from CNET. CNET says, universal control from Apple deepens the iOS Mac OS relationship. Mm -hmm. 9 to 5 Mac says, universal control was worth the wait. Here's how it's changing the way I work. Mm -hmm. The Verge headline, universal control is Apple's most impressive new feature in years. Dang. Now that's saying something. So to recap, or in case you're saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. Universal control is a beta feature that's now available in iPad OS 15.4 and Mac OS 12.3. It shares input controls between an iPad and a Mac without needing a keyboard, video, and mouse or KVM switch. It's not screen sharing either. That is sidecar. This is different. With universal control, your mouse can copy something on the Mac, then pop over to the iPad, and then paste it in an iPad OS app. 
You can also drag files between the two, you know, going back and forth. And an iPad keyboard or accessory can control a Mac as well. That is very, very helpful if you happen to have both of these hardware tools. Third-party software has accomplished this for years. You might say, well, hold on a second. Why is universal control that great? It's native. It's native to the operating system and by early accounts works really well. But it's on by default for upgraded users and it's not necessarily obvious how you control it. Multiple writers remarked that they had to turn it on and off again or you know, maybe even a couple times to get it working, to, to, get, to get sync working. The devices that you want to have that you uh, want to use have to have Bluetooth on. Uh, they ha all have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. That's pretty standard. On a Mac, you have to go to the display settings and check all three universal control boxes. Once you do that, you can add an iPad. And now, if you're on the iPad first and going the other way, you have to have cursor and keyboard beta enabled in the AirPlay and handoff settings. So this is something that you have to want to do but if you want to do it it sounds like it's working pretty well yeah stephanie uh i, I saw you uh you reacted to most impressive feature in years <laughs> <laughs> i mean i was blown away by the m1 ultra i really you know i, I thought universal control was you know a, a cool sort of feature to have yeah it why didn't it why didn't it exist before but um but that wasn't the most impressive thing that i that i took away from from that um apple event so i feel like this is one of those situations where it looked cool in the demo but once you actually use it people are getting that that first love blush of a new feature where they're like <laughs> oh my gosh it actually works like mm -hmm. i i don't have to think about it because that is one of the nice things it, it is. It turns on by default, and then you just set your iPad next to it, and you don't have to go in and futz with settings. Uh, yeah. Because what what struck me about this is all, all these articles said I did have to go turn it off and on again later. You know, it worked the first time, but then later I had to mess with it. I'm like, that sounds just as buggy as <laughs> sidecar to me. But I think the impressiveness of not having to turn it on in the first place and having it work has probably got a lot of people excited. And it probably works really smooth because it's at the OS level instead of having to do a third party right. thing. Right. I don't use an iPad regularly anymore and haven't for some time, but I certainly am on Mac OS all day, every day. And I have other uh, Apple products. The idea, you know, the, what for, from what I can glean from these reviews is it just works. And I know, you know, there's a lot of eye rolling that comes with that, but if it does just work with the absolute um, least amount of, uh, you know, trying to figure out, I mean, even to this day, it's like, I, I will be on my phone. I need to send something to my computer. And I'm like, do I text it to myself? Yeah, maybe I do that. That would be the easiest thing. Anything that is truly, we're all in, you know, one OS, uh, just, you know, dragging and dropping, is a game changer it is all right this next story is going to be really bad for people who love passwords mm. so everyone's going to love this story the fido <laughs> alliance is an industry-wide authentication project with the stated aim of getting rid of passwords while improving security not just maintaining it but making it even better uh, we have a whole episode of know a little more about it we'll link to that in the show notes fido technology is pretty solid it, they've got it working it can perform multi-factor authentication using secure keys without you having to have something that you could get fished uh, you know, trying to put in. It's more secure than passwords in that respect. And it's supported. Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari, and Opera all support it. It also works with Apple's Face ID and Touch ID on Safari. All Android devices, version 7 and higher, are FIDO2 certified. So why don't we see it everywhere is because websites need to implement it. Websites are waiting for the pressure from their users before do they go to the trouble of changing everything up and moving people onto FIDO instead of passwords. Thursday, FIDO published a, pass, a paper they think has cracked the problem of user resistance. And it took all their firepower to make this paper. FIDO members collaborating on this paper included folks from Intel, Qualcomm, Amazon, Meta, American Express, Bank of America, Google, Microsoft, and Apple. That's some 
that's a yeah. lot of brains. So, some consensus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Fido works by authorizing a device to help you log in. Now, that might be a YubiKey uh, that you use. Uh, in most use cases, it's something like your phone or maybe even a smartwatch. And they argue that you need a simple way to switch or add new devices to this scheme. Because if you have to fall back to passwords every time you get a new phone, then people are going to be like, why am I doing this thing? I have to add, you remember all these passwords anyway. So FIDO suggests operating systems implement something called the FIDO Credential Manager. It's basically a password manager, but instead of for passwords, it's for the cryptographic tokens that FIDO uses. Android or iOS or Windows could all migrate them when you move to a new system so you don't have to log in again. It would do that thing that FIDO is good at of saying, not only did we uh, make it the same, we made it better because you're not going to have to do anything. As long as you authorize the move securely, then all your tokens move locally. doesn't have to be in the cloud. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Apple's already implemented an end-to-end -end encrypted version of this called Passkeys in iCloud Keychain. Now, that one does use the cloud, but it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so it's under your control. Passkeys is just their name for a web authn credential, and a web authn credential is what Fido uses. So that can be the credential manager for Apple. Fido also suggests a procedure to let a device act like a big token over Bluetooth. So just like a Bluetooth security dongle, like Google's Titan security key, your entire laptop or your entire phone could act like the dongle and make it easy to switch between operating systems, like going to iOS to Android, for instance. Uh, I, if y'all have questions about this, I'm not like a super expert. I can try to answer them, but this does seem like if they can get people to implement it, they would make life a lot easier in a lot of ways. Well, I think a lot of, uh, and myself included, um, when this kind of like, if you want to be as secure as possible to have some sort of a hardware key, but, uh, that you use to log into various devices is the, is the vibe. Um, and people go, oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, can I just use passwords? But the idea that you already have a device that can be used as that dongle to unlock another device, that's, I think, where, you know, sort of the sweet spot where people like me are like, I mean, I care about privacy. I care about security very much, but I also care about ease of use. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's where this seems to be going forward. And my thing, I mean, I might just be getting caught up on semantics here, but um, the idea that it's fish proof, uh, that was what I got hung up on because fishing sort of implies human error. And I think there will always be human error. So, you know, maybe instead of um, someone being able to get your password, now there's a bunch of different websites that get spoofed so that you put your key in a website that you thought was the one you wanted, but is now um, something different where they can still collect that information. So uh, I, I, I would be very careful about using the term fish proof because I feel I, like people always find a way. I feel pretty good that they can say fish proof. It doesn't mean it's without any security flaws. And I, I think you're right to, to be suspicious. But phishing usually says, put in your token here. You put it in and they steal it. Mm -hmm. The way FIDO works, both the website and the token have to be in agreement for it to work. So there's okay. no way to steal it. There's okay. no there's no way for you, even if you put it in, even if you're at the wrong website and you put your token in, the, web, right. the website can't get anything out of it because it's using PGP. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, whereas if you type in your plain text, that code from text message that can get fished, right. your, your FIDO token can't get fished. Doesn't mean there aren't other flaws. You're absolutely okay. right. And people will figure those out, <laughs> but at least it, <laughs> it cuts down on them. Right. And right. that's the idea. Right. Nothing's ever going to be entirely foolproof, but you've gotten rid of one main avenue, you know? Yeah. And so that, that's super helpful, okay. but well, that it's makes a good sense. question. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good question to have. Well, recently on a podcast called It's a Thing, uh, oh, co-host Tom Merritt and Molly Wood talked mm -hmm. about the air wrap from Dyson. If you are not familiar, I don't blame you, but it is a part curling iron, part hair dryer, and has been quite the social media rage. TikTok alone, lots of videos about this particular uh, device. I happen to have a knockoff um, that I use 
sporadically um, from Revlon, which is way cheaper. But let me tell you a little bit more about the Dyson and why people like it so much. Dyson announced Thursday a new version is coming later this summer, and here is how it's getting better. The air wrap takes advantage of something called the Kawanda effect, which is the tendency of jet uh, of fluid or air to fall at a convex surface. So if you're thinking about hair, a high pressure motor pulls hair onto the barrel device to style hair without heat and then theoretically without heat damage, which is one of the things that, uh, you know, is kind of an issue with uh, um, heating your hair every day with a really hot hair dryer. In the current air wrap, the attachment determines what direction you're curling. The new air wrap will have a switch that changes flow of the air so you don't have to switch out attachments just to curl in different directions. You will st still need to switch the barrels depending on how big of a curl you're looking for, you know? No, no judgment. It's all about you. The barrels come in 30 millimeter, 40 millimeter, or uh, 40 millimeter long and 20 millimeter long. Lots of options there. There are also new attachments like a smoothing dryer that promises to take your hair from wet to damp without flyaways. We'll see. Uh, something Dyson Supersonic Hair Dryer also promises. There's also firm and soft brushes for a straight finish. And Dyson says that the whole thing is going to work a lot faster. And if you have the current airdrop, Dyson will sell you the new attachment separately. Sounds great, right? Well, it depends on what your wallet has inside because the new air wrap with all the attachments will cost 600 US dollars. We don't have an exact date yet. Sometime this summer is coming, but man, you got to like this thing in order to buy it. Stephanie, you and I are going to be using I'm, this. Yeah, this is one of those times where I'm glad I have no hair. I, I have no <laughs> dog in this fight. Um, I will say, however, though, that, um, you know, Dyson is like the apple of its products. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the quality and the design and, and all of the science and, and, and thinking behind Dyson products. So I can appreciate what they're doing here. Would I spend $600 if I had hair uh, to get the perfect beach wave? Um, I, I doubt it. But um, <laughs> if, if that's something that, you know, you're into and, and your hair is your thing and, and it's important for you for it to look a certain way and get a certain result every single time then you know i think this could be worth it but you know i'd have we we need to look at that cost per use yeah when molly was was uh, telling me about this on it's a thing uh i was i was fascinated with the quanda effect i think that alone the the science behind it is interesting how it, it's mm -hmm. able to use that that's the other thing dyson's really good about is 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 finding interesting science and then turning it into a product yep. uh mm -hmm. But she also, uh, Sarah, was like, yeah, but the Revlon one does the same thing. It's way cheaper. So it's like, I think it's, it's like $30. Yeah. So I, I mean, think it's super smart for Dyson to be like, oh, but that Rev Revlon hasn't caught up with this. Now That's you right. can you can well, curl both and directions. The, and, and you don't you, have like 12 different attachments on the Revlon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also, you know, it kind of gets into the sort of like, well, I mean, do you like bathe in La Mer lotion? Or do you just mm -hmm, use, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, Lubriderm? Ivory soap and Vaseline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's, 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 it, you, uh, not, not, there is not one uh, size that fits all here, but... Um, it is true that the Dyson hair dryer uh, hybrid, the air wrap, um, is it is well beloved by people who blow out their hair yeah. a lot. It's so. the investment bag of hairstyling products. It really go. is. Yeah. <laughs> the Hermes of hair products. Uh, totally. Uh, hey, folks, if you're feeling social and you want to get in touch with us on your social media of choice, uh, you can do so on Twitter, DTNS Show, and Instagram, DTNS Picks, DTNS P I X. Go find us. California State Assembly members have introduced a bipartisan bill uh, called, and, and really like Republican and a Democrat, both got together. Uh, it's called the Social Media Platform Duty to Children Act. The bill would require social media companies to design their features and data collection practices in order to prevent child users from becoming addicted. Now, there's going to be a lot of questions. You're going to be like, okay, 
How do you figure this out? The bill relies in its justifications on something called the Bergen Social Media Addiction Scale. Uh, that's that's a well-accepted scale for measuring this stuff. That scale estimates about 5% of the general population exhibits signs of social media addiction. Now, there's a debate in the psychological community over whether this is actually an addiction or some other kinds of disorder, and neither the WHO or the DSM-5 have recognized problematic social media use yet because of that debate. They're waiting for some consensus to build. The bill also relies on leaked internal studies from Meta and, of course, the testimony of former Facebook product manager Francis Haugen. Uh, what do they mean by addiction, though? Okay, we've got their justifications. The bill defines addiction as, quote, preoccupation or obsession with or withdrawal or difficulty to cease or reduce use of a social media platform despite the user's desire to cease or reduce that use. In other words, you get caught up in it and you can't stop. Uh, also causing or contributing to physical, mental, emotional development or material harms to the user. This is a pretty standard definition of addiction. So you're going to have to show a court that you met the standard of an addiction. What does it require companies to do? Well, if you make less than $100 million a year, nothing. You're exempt. However, the bigger social media companies, if they are found in violation of the act, uh, must show that they didn't know or shouldn't have known that their service encouraged addictive behavior. Or another way of putting that, if they knew or should have known that the, what their algorithm that they had would, would produce addictive behavior, then they're in violation. To avoid these penalties, companies can engage in quarterly audits to detect potentially addictive practices. In other words, we put in a new algorithm, we did an audit every quarter to make sure it wasn't encouraging addiction. And then if they find evidence that it does, they have to correct it within 30 days. If they violate the act though, the government is not punishing them. It's the new fad in US bills to authorize lawsuits. So if they are found in violation, parents and guardians can sue for damages that can range up to $25,000 per child per year in a civil suit. Uh, class action suits can also be brought at around $1,000 per child, and other penalties are, are delineated in there as well. Uh, to defend themselves, then, companies would have to show with a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant's injuries were not caused by the actions of the company. So, so it shifts the burden of proof pretty far onto the social media companies. Uh, Stephanie, I know you you followed this story pretty closely. Yeah. Uh, what what do you think uh, of this attempt to remedy? I don't think it's going to work. Um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of, I don't want to call them frivolous because obviously parents have, you know, concerns around this. Um and 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 their concerns are legitimate, but we're going to see a lot of lawsuits. But I don't think we're going to see a lot of the result that people expect uh, from those lawsuits. I don't even think the, the social media platforms are going to just throw money at the problem just to to get those folks to go away. Um, this is is not the best way to go about this issue. Uh, I do a workshop called Till Death Do You Tweet. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. And I and I talk to students and parents about social media and, and how to, you know, kind of manage and maneuver that whole thing. And while I am not blaming parents, let me go on record, I will say that, you know, sort of anecdotally, when I when I speak to parents at these seminars, they do tend to, for whatever reason, whether it be, you know, technology intimidation or, or whatever the case, they do tend to have more of a hands off approach with respect to the amount of time their kids spend on their devices, you know, when they can use them, if they're putting them away for dinner, putting them away for bedtime, that kind of thing. And, and I think we just need to do a better job of empowering parents to sort of take back some of that authority um, with their children on how and when um, they can use their phone and how much they can use their devices. Yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting way of looking at this because the problem I have with this bill is that there's not enough knowledge of what actually causes the problems. It's very clear right. there is a problem. We've gotten right. that far. Uh, and it, and it, it, it thankfully is not super pervasive, but well, and that's it, the thing too. It's a problem, but how big a problem is yeah. it? You but know? It, yeah. You know, I, I the get there. Like, even if it's a few thousand children, we want to do something to protect them. Yeah. I feel like, until we know more about what the actual causes are, we got a lot of correlations, but not a lot of causes, mm -hmm. that the best thing that a parent can do 
is what you're suggesting, which is take an active role, observe, see what, Absolutely. see what's going on. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, I've had parents tell me, you know, well, they just get so angry when we try to take their phone. I'm like, but, and then I always push back. I'm like, but don't you pay for it? that phone <laughs> like aren't isn't it in your name and the bill's coming to you and you're doing all like like it just like I, I feel I don't know where that disconnect happens where where parents don't feel empowered to put some limits on uh what their kids are doing with their devices but there is definitely a disconnect at least in yeah. the parents that I've spoken to um over how much they can sort of tell their kids what to do basically and and it doesn't even need to be you know, that dictatorish type of thing, like you do what I say, you know, you can come up with a digital contract and, and work with your child to talk about how long we can do it, how much time on the weekends, you know, when do phones need to go off, where will phones be stored every night when they get turned off. So, you know, I think if, if we could get more families having that conversation, this type of legislation would not be necessary. I, th I think a lot of what you're talking about, you know, if you swap out smartphone and put in Walkman, anything, TV, video anything. game console, yeah. like oh, go, <laughs> go back decades, a lot of the same things still work. I'm not saying it's entirely the same and there probably are differences, but, but man, we, we, we this, this sounds like it rhymes, you know, history yes. rhymes. <laughs> yes. This sounds like it rhymes to me. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Well, if uh, if you're thinking about taking a trip and you're worried about inflation, putting a bit of a squeeze on your wallet in a variety of ways, the Amateur Traveler has a tip for those who want to maximize spending power before going on that trip. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This particular tip will help you even if you are not a traveler, and it's a way to save some money or to earn some miles for your trips using credit cards or cashback websites, and it's a site called cashbackmonitor.com. This is an ugly site. This is a site that looks like it comes from a dystopian future where all web designers were turned into zombies, but it's a useful site because you can find whatever store you're shopping at, what's the best deal or what's the best credit card to use, including which coupon sites can get you more cash back on your purchase. And so if you're a travel hacker, you can look for what credit card to use to get the most miles and otherwise you can just look to how to save money. The site again is cashbackmonitor.com and this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. As they say, it ain't pretty but it's usable. <laughs> That's right. That's a great tip though. Yeah, yeah. thanks Chris. It's like my that. my Revlon hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's Works. check out the mailbag. Uh let's do it. So Mike and Dubai wanted to pass along a few thoughts about fact checking because we were talking about uh, various ways that we fact check with Justin Robert Young, who was on the show yesterday, Mike says a friend, a friend posted a tweet that made claims about companies, recent profits and price hikes and their role in inflation. The post was flagged with a fact check. And I thought maybe the numbers or claims were incorrect. They weren't. The fact check linked to an AP article asking a handful of economists whether record uh, corporate profits played a role in fueling inflation. The economists uh, in, uh, interviewed by the AP all said, probably not. However, not a single economist interviewed had studied the issue. I can continue to support fact-checking on social media, but it needs to meet a higher threshold than linking to an article that just asks some smart people for some hot takes. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of weaknesses, right? It, and it has to be done right for it to work. And the story we were talking about yesterday was that people who read fact-checking of an article were more likely to then no longer trust the source of the article, even if the fact they checked was a quote. Uh, and, right. and so they were saying, well, the fact checking needs to make clear who you're fact checking. Uh, and this is another example of like, well, is this a fact that you're checking or is it, is it a, an assumption that you're checking? Those, those can be different things. Well, thanks, Mike in Dubai, and thanks to everybody who writes in with questions, comments, feedback for us. Feedback at dailytechnewshow.com is where to send those emails. You make our show better. Thank you in advance for all of your hive-mindedness. Uh, also, thanks to Stephanie Humphrey for being with us today. Uh, what's going on with you, Stephanie? Where should people keep up with your work? 
Well, I'm rocking all around the web at Tech Life Steph, but of course, the techjohn.com, J A W N, and shameless plug for the merch now uh, that we have in our store. So check out the website, go get some merch, join our Patreon, all that good stuff. Well, we're so happy to have you, um, and and thanks for being here, as always. Good stuff. Also, a special thanks to James Graham. James Graham is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Couldn't do it without you, James. Thank you for all your years of support. Yeah, you want to get you want to get that. Thanks, folks. Become a new supporter. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We might be thanking you tomorrow. Getting all we that will, applause. We will you. thank you all. <laughs> There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. If you know the show, you already know what time it is but uh if you want to know more patreon.com slash dtns uh it'll be rolling for all you live folks in just a few just a reminder dtns is live monday through friday at 4 p.m eastern that's 20 hundred utc find out more at dailytechnoshow.com slash live have a great weekend everybody we'll be back monday this week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Pete Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show include Allison Sheridan, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Our guest on this week's show was Stephanie Humphrey. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>